Hello, and welcome to a Sunny Book Nook. My name is Sunny, and today I have my Trader Joe's 100% mango juice and the stack of books that I have read in the first half of January. I am filming part one of this video before the end of January, and at the end of January, I will film part two of this video because I tackled quite a bit off of my physical TBR, as you can see, this past first half of the month. And I'm proud of myself for that because my physical TBR and me, we've been battling it out for years now. Um, <laughs> and I'm finally getting a little bit of the upper hand, I think. So that's good. But I also don't want to bring these with me to Boston because I am going to be traveling and being away from St. Louis for the next year this upcoming year of 2023 so i'd rather just keep these at home base and so i wasn't gonna you know bring these with me anyway that's why we're gonna be filming part one and part two of this january wrap up in two different locations and you're gonna be seeing me in two different locations in this video i'm gonna splice them together <laughs> when it comes to the end of the month and i wrap up the books i read in january that being said let's get into the books that i've read so far in january it's been such a good reading month so far i feel like oftentimes i start off the reading year so strong and kick it off with some bangers <laughs> this year has not been any different in fact the very first book that i read this year was a five star read and that was amazing i will be going through all the books that i read this month so far in the order that i read them from the beginning of the month till now mid-month so that's typical and that's what we're gonna be doing so let's just get into it the first book that i have here is things to do when you're goth in the country and other stories by shavisa woods this book well you know it's a five star read for me and i loved it it was brilliant it's a short story collection as you could imagine and each short story in here is brilliant original funny or sad or both and just thought provoking and real and gritty and raw it's just so oh my gosh it's very evocative of the rural american south the country like the backwoods type energy the midwest the south and as someone who's grown up in the midwest and the south my whole life like not in rural areas as much but this book very much contends with those thematically and also what it's like to grow up in really religious communities and these like evangelical baptist sort of centered christian communities and faith-based like families and whatnot but also what it means to be from like a small town and those dynamics or being a queer child growing up in that midst what it's like to be inundated with military propaganda at, during the Bush era, uh, you know, post 9-11 and also during the Obama years, like, you know, the right wing country politics of this environment and what that actually means for people in their actual lives and how the imperialist military and how America as like an empire functions for people who are victims of it abroad and also people who are preyed upon in these impoverished rural communities and areas while also looking at and interrogating systems of like gendered violence and mental illness and of course poverty it's very brilliant but and incisive and it's not like redundant or preachy i think that is because each story is so original and earnest and speaks so much truth and reality to whatever given situation that it's portraying the author is a lesbian poet based in new york city so i think she's from like the backwoods and that's why there's a familiarity with the environment that she's writing about 
each story to go through each one is very interesting. So the first story is how to stop smoking, Usama. <laughs> Usama is a play on words of like USA and Osama bin Laden and the day that he was killed. It's about this like woman who comes back to her rural community because of a situation with her family and weird shit is happening but this is the same night that Osama bin Laden is killed and so all this shit is going on. There's a weird magical realism element to that story as well and it's very like full of dread and anxiety and then the next story in here is zombie which i really loved it was such a memorable story it's about these two little girls who play in a cemetery like just you know for fun they're like 11 12 13 and one of them is more like butch coated <laughs> like she's already being seen as kind of like oh that that one's kind of gay um but these just two best friends who play in this graveyard and one day they think they see a zombie but it's a woman who lives in this in the graveyard in this um what's it called like not a tomb but essentially like a crypt situation she lives in one of those areas and it's like a shelter and they end up becoming like friends with her essentially and that was a very interesting story and then take the way that and then the next story is take the way home that leads back to sullivan street is about this woman who is in a lesbian relationship with someone who has schizophrenia and it, it it's about them <laughs> they they get they take there's like a shrooms trip or like an acid trip and they're at a mensa party the next story is what's happening on the news and it's from the perspective of a young girl who is like a devoutly Christian and her friend in her class is a boy who wants to be a film director and it's like her point of view and her narrating about you know what it's like her desires and dreams and then like there's a scene where the military recruiter comes into the classroom and yeah, the next story is A Little Aside, which is a really short, like, flash fiction piece that is, like, the ramblings of a conspiracy theorist, and then A New Mohawk. That was a really crazy short story and really interesting. It's about this trans guy who... <laughs> goes to like a protest to try to impress this girl it's a protest against the israeli occupation and then the next day he wakes up and like finds that he has a replication of the gaza strip on his head crazy shit but that was a really good and wild story and then the next story is Revelations, which feels very Flannery O'Connor. It's about this older woman at this Baptist church in the South, and this church has dwindling numbers, and the pastor is like, we need to all look within and make sure that none of us has a darkness inside our heart. And she's like, oh no, like, it might be me. But then she gets roped into this little meeting with a couple other church congregants and then finds out some Revelations, right? And then the last story is the titular one, Things to Do When You're Goth in the Country. And yeah, I feel like that's pretty, that's pretty self-explanatory. It's kind of like uh, speaking directly to the reader of these are things that you can do when you're goth in the country. <laughs> so anyways, this book was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And yeah. Anyways, I talked about this one for a while, but that's because I love talking about books that I love. The next book that I read was You Exist Too Much by Zaina Arafat. This book was really interesting. I started this a while ago and then finally finished it this month. And yeah, like it's about this bisexual Palestinian American girl who is struggling with an eating disorder and also a really, really fucked up weird relationship with her mom. It's a codependency 
and it's a toxic codependency and she's trying to move away from that and she's also addicted to like love and sex and so she goes to like a rehab facility for that because in the beginning of the novel she's cheating on her girlfriend and like at least emotionally by being obsessed with this one professor Anyways, throughout the entirety of this book, we see her get in and out of different like affairs, go in and out of rehab or be in rehab and then later out of it, sort of reflect back on her childhood and growing up, reflect on her relationships and try to just cope and be better. And it's very much about trauma and writing through trauma because our main character is a writer and also like what it means to be a queer Palestinian woman, what it means to try to uh, like live in the diaspora as a Palestinian and like not really feel like she knows enough, but also it's sort of being really self-destructive in a lot of her behaviors. And I think like this was a really good literary contemporary fiction novel. I enjoyed it a lot. I think it really resonated with me on a lot of levels and I would definitely recommend it because of those reasons. It is a really compelling story and narrative and it's worth picking up for sure. I think that the writing is pretty solid. There's a lot of really interesting relationships and relationship dynamics that are explored in here and it was so cool and <laughs> disturbing and interesting to see her interacting with all these different people and how and why she did essentially. So yeah, I rated this like four stars, maybe 3.5. The next book that I read this past month was Maria Maria by Maritza K. Rubio. It's a short story collection and I rated this three stars because I thought some of these stories were good and others were just mediocre or like mid to me. But I think that the sort of themes that they overarchingly get and tie together of like tarot and mysticism and Latin American history and culture in contemporary times regarding the spirituality of these characters and there's like magical realism elements of like ghosts and stuff like that were interesting and that was cool to see and seeing these family relationships and dynamics play out the trauma of different characters of what they experienced and how they got there and then like the different premonitions and stuff that other people in their family had had about them i like the stories tajuka or tayuka and that was about a woman who's husband dies and then she goes on this like journey regarding his death and dead body. I liked the story Tunnels which is about like the past, present, and future and it melds those things in a really interesting way and of like dystopia and our current dystopia. I like the story Clap If You Believe. It's about this young girl who gets recruited to go on this like mission thing for the government but I think a lot of the later stories were just not as compelling for me, I guess. There's also these illustrations in here that are really interesting. Like here's this one and this one. I don't know if you can see that even, but they play with and are part of the stories in an interesting way as well. The story is about like a road sign and this is what the road sign is supposed to look like. So it's kind of multimedia in that way. So if you like that, you should definitely pick up this book and like the physical copy. It is a solid collection and it's pretty imaginative and plays with form and storytelling in a really interesting way and takes on a lot of different themes and like magic and feminism and these magical realism-esque themes. So yeah, I, I liked it, but it just wasn't necessarily a standout read for me. It kind of fell flat 
in some ways, maybe because I'm less of an avant-garde reader <laughs> in terms of my short story tastes, so... The next book that I read wasn't off of my physical TBR. It was an audiobook I listened to via Libby, and that is Lamb, the Gospel According to Biff, Christ's Childhood Pal by Christopher Moore. This book was pretty excellent, very funny, and a good time, but very problematic. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, maybe I'm being too hashtag sensitive and reading too much into it, but like, <laughs> because this was published in the early 2000s, I think that the early 2000s like racism and sexism of some of the jokes and also not as much the premise, but a little bit, and some of the elements of like the setting and characters were a little bit just like mm, that's that would not fly today like <laughs> that's not something that you could really publish today and just not be like called out for but I think in general the way this story was told and the, the framing device the humor the characterization the relationships the way that it takes on the story of Jesus Christ and the Gospels and biblical times and that history the magic and mysticism of that inherent to it, the folklore and storytelling of it, and takes it in a contemporary but historical lens in this humorous way, in a retelling way, in a way that sort of tracks back and brings the reader forward to the point where we understand generally the lore of what Christianity even is now. And it's in that way it's quite brilliant and humorous as fuck like there are so many dimensions of humor going on here that it's almost impressive all the ways that it is funny and also the way that this hero's journey to boy best friend narrative played out as well throughout like the Orient, right? Like the Far East, when they go to <laughs> what is currently known as like Syria or Iraq, or, you know, and they're meeting up with like the East African Magi or the Chinese monk or the Indian uh, Buddhist or whatever. Like they're, they're meeting with all these mysticists or people who are spiritual practitioners and learning a lot from them. And also Mary Magdalene is a character in here and she's known as Maggie. Especially because I have so much knowledge about the Bible and the biblical world on a historical and religious level. Well, not so much, but like I have a pretty extended amount, <laughs> I would say. Uh, this book was both incredibly accurate and in where it isn't, it was funny as fuck as to why it wasn't and or, or like it would play with the historical accuracy or like the biblical storytelling elements of this in a way that was pretty smart and also pretty hilarious and I think like the more of the bible you understand and the more you know about like the history of Jews existing under the Roman Empire, uh, you the more you would get out of this, you know, or not that you have to have that background information to get into this book or to like it, because I think anyone could enjoy this if, you know, you don't take Christianity or Judaism too seriously, maybe. If you don't take any religion too seriously, I think you would think this is funny because it is blasphemous to insinuate that there is a missing book of the Bible, of course. But I think the way that this story is framed in which we get like this guy, Biff, being like raised from the dead by a dumbass angel and he gets locked in like a hotel room in Mexico and is given like a book, like a journal, and the angel is like, write, write down everything that happened between you and Jesus from childhood to now. And he's like, what the fuck? And he's like trapped in there and he's writing everything that he remembers down. And so every other chapter-ish kind of, we get a lot more of obviously the scenes from the his childhood and his adolescence and adulthood with Jesus than him in the hotel room trapped. But 
the way that it ends, the way that the whole story plays out, it was really satisfying and really good and well done. And I enjoyed it a lot. So I rated it four stars, maybe 4.5, because I was just like, this is good, but it is sexist and racist in ways that I cannot overlook because it also tries to subvert sexist and racist tropes and narratives in ways as well. And I can give it credit there because I think it does do that pretty well at different points. But you know, the, the feminist in me just, I can't, I, <laughs> Maybe maybe I'm just too harsh. Maybe I'm too much of a snowflake liberal or whatever the fuck, you know? But yeah, I liked it. I liked it. I had a good time. I was gripped. I was on the edge of my seat. The next book that I read was a Lero FM ALC influencer program read. So thank you to them for that. And that was This Is Supposed To Be Fun by Maisha Battle. This book is sort of like a guide to dating and specifically online dating and dating apps and stuff. And it's from this dating and love and sex coach who is essentially giving us her advice and her experiences and anecdotes from her clients and what's worked for them and what's not worked for them and how she's worked with them and it was just it was an interesting read like it's a good type of self-help book if you're trying to get into or return to dating in like the digital age and in a contemporary way and so I rated it like three stars, four stars it's just it's so like I think it's good for what it is it's just not something that's like necessarily personally helpful for me like especially because I'm like Gen Z and a lesbian <laughs> I don't know I think the, the thing is is that Maisha Battle ha talks about having worked with different clients of various demographics and their different struggles whether they be like gay men of color and or, or like polyamorous women or women who have kids and are just going back into the dating scene. So she has a lot of experience with working with a lot of different types of people, but obviously because she is like a millennial and most of her clients are around at her age range or older, it wasn't necessarily as helpful for me, but I do think that is a type of thing that a lot of people would really benefit from picking up because there's a lot of like emotional guidelines for how to deal with like the actual elements of dating and breaking up and like tips for how to navigate that type of shit and like why you shouldn't just like ghost people or you know how to communicate better and how to set your intentions for dating so that you can get the best out of it or like what you want out of it and what you know how to navigate the apps so that you can and in that way i think it's pretty helpful and a useful read and i think that a lot of people should pick this up because i think if you can make it also has a lot of good tips for making your dating profile better because let me tell you a lot of these bitches profiles are not good <laughs> and she uh, she has good tips for how to improve them and I would also say that it was very targeted of course towards the digital element of it of dating via apps and online and such so i think it wouldn't be as helpful if you're trying to figure out dating if you're not into that but also part of the reason why a book like this needs to exist and has been written is because that's so much of what the dating scene and world looks like now so i get it you know and for that it is a four star read for me. Um, yeah, my mistress cracked if you heard that. The next book that I read, very different, but this was a five star read, maybe a 4.5 star read, I'm not sure yet. And that is Women Talking by Miriam Tebbs. This book I have had on my shelf for like fucking years. It's also been turned into a show now, I think, and it's been on 
best of year lists like four or five years ago stuff like that like it's been out for a while and a lot of people have read this so I feel like this is probably on people's favorites list like three to five years ago on YouTube but and I finally got around to reading it and I get why I think it is pretty excellent it's about this South American Mennonite community and these women who are experiencing the aftermath of something that has really shaken their community, which is that bands of men in their community, their brothers, husbands, fathers, cousins, have broken into and drugged women at, in their community at night and raped them. And this has occurred sort of continuously and the pastor and the leader of the church and the Mennonite community was just like, mm, it was demons, like y'all are silly women. But then eventually it was like, no, like this, a crime is happening. And so they got put on trial and like were held in jail. And so this book follows them, follows these women talking for like three days or nights as they contemplate what to do in the aftermath of this situation. But it is all being told through the perspective of a man who left the Mennonite community years ago. Because the thing is, is that all of the men essentially in the Mennonite community have gone to out of the rural area that they live in to the city to try to bail out the men who are in the jails and in the prisons. And so now it's just the women there. And none of the women can read or write because women aren't taught to be literate in this community. And so August is the one who is taking the notes for this meeting. And so that's why that's what the framework and the framing device of this story and novel is being told through. Like, my name is August. I am taking the notes for this meeting. And this is what they said. So the whole book is essentially him writing about himself, but more importantly, him writing what the women are saying. And those things obviously have a lot to do with each other and the dynamics and interplay within those things gets addressed in the story directly because the women will be talking and then they'll turn to him and be like, and then they'll be silent and they'll turn to him and be like, you're writing even though we're not talking. What were you writing down? And he's like, um... But obviously we know what he was writing because what he's writing is what we're reading. So it's like stuff like that. And I think that also because he has an outside perspective, because he left the Mennonite community when he was really young, his parents and him were like excommunicated, excommunicated. He has an outside perspective on the rest of the world that the other people in the Mennonite community no longer and just don't have. And so he offers a perspective for the people in for the Mennonites and also for us as the reader as he is, you know, taking the notes and, and describing what's going on while still being sympathetic to it because he is now back again a part of the community. And we see towards the beginning of the book how he got back to it. But the feminist narrative of the story and the spiritual narrative and the religious one is what makes this book so compelling because the thing about these women and the thing about the Mennonites is that they are all pretty closely related to each other. They're, you know, because if it's like generations of a community, the families marrying each other and stuff, it's like, okay, because it's a religious community, everyone refers to each other as like brother and sister. So the fact that this has occurred, this violence in the community has happened, and reveals underlying issues within the Mennonite community. And we see how the women come to terms with that and deal with it and discuss it. And there's a lot of tension and fighting and the interpersonal relationships and conflicts that are present in the arguments and fights about the and the discussions, the theological ones, as well as the the gendered ones, as well as the ones about just like practically what are we supposed to do are so also deeply intertwined. And in that way, this book is so political and driven through that, but fundamentally through the emotions and lived experiences and the realities of the struggles of these people and how they are trying to deal with the situation at hand. It was harrowing and it was deftly and beautifully conveyed 
And there's just so much sorrow and just a gorgeous and very strong sense of voice being told here. And I think that is what Miriam Tebb's writing is so... That's what makes her writing so brilliant. Because I've read one of her other books, I think, and it's called Fight Night. And I read that last year and I enjoyed it. And it's very different, but it also has like feminist themes and intergenerational family women stories. But yeah, this was really good. So if you haven't read it already and that seems interesting to you, pick this one up. Okay, the next book that I read was Socialist Realism by Trisha Lowe. This book is a nonfiction sort of auto theory type book. It's a extended essay and Trisha Lowe is a poet and writer and performance artist. She has like an MFA in performance art, I believe. And she w grew up and was born in Singapore, I believe, and is talking about her like diasporic identity, of course, and the relationship that she has with like her parents, and her family, as well as like her queer community and her friends and her partner and the way that these things have emerged and in relationship to her art and her art making and her art criticism there's a lot of art criticism and like literary criticism and film criticism interwoven in little sprinklets throughout this it is driven narratively through the move that she made from New York City to California like her move out west and the way that she does like a, her self-discovery moment and so it's also partially like personal memoir and personal narrative and it's also her thoughts on in artistic movement socialist realism but you know i gave it three stars because i don't i, I think it was well written and well conveyed and it does the personal extended essay well and it has some good and interesting ideas and there's some really interesting points here I don't necessarily agree with a lot of the conclusions that she comes to. I think a lot of what she says is really interesting. There are some points that I'm like, wow, this is so real and cool and true. But I don't know. She's very much a queer millennial, <laughs> is what I will say. And I also read this as a part of a reading vlog that will be either up by now or will be going up soon and I read some excerpts in there and talk about my thoughts on this as I'm reading it. So go check that out if you want more of my thoughts on this. But yeah, three star. And the next book that I read this month was The Very Nice Box by Laura Blackett and Eve Gleishman. This book I rated like four stars, but I think it's more of a five star. 4.5 five star again so many good reads this past month so far whoa i hope the streak continues but the very nice box i also read in the reading vlog where i got to socialist realism as well as the next couple books i'm going to be talking about but this book was wow Ooh, i really like this so basically it is about this woman who works at a is it Swedish or Norwegian? I keep on confusing that. Anyway, she works for this company, this furniture design company called Stada. And it's very slick and modern. It's based in Brooklyn. And our main character is named Ava. And she is very anxious and neat and precise. She has a very configurated and specific way of going about her life and doing things and she does not want those things to change or be disturbed. She's been living like this for years and that's how she wants it to be. She has her packed lunch with her perfectly balanced nutritional meals every day. She goes to work at a specific and hourly appointed time. She's very good at her job as an engineer. She is working on a project called The Very Nice Box and it is something that she is very passionate about designing and we get to see that throughout the entirety of this book but things get shaken up at this company when this new guy gets brought in named matt who they start having a bit of a weird workplace romance relationship but it devolves into something kind of sinister or it starts off and ends and Throughout the entirety of this, there's like, it's very much a commentary on grief 
capitalism, loneliness. It's it's very good. I think that I was very gripped by this story and this book that and I and I and I talk more about this in the reading vlog so you should check that out. The comp titles in here and I talk about this in the vlog as well are Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine and Severance by Ling Ma. I think those are good comp titles and I really liked this. I liked this disturbed girl literary fiction contemporary vibe and she's also queer and that is a big element of the story because the grief that she experiences in here is related to her ex and it's it's so sad but yeah we see her growth and her navigate that and there's also a really really fun and sad and gorgeous and funny and amazing workplace queer friendship in here as well yeah, I really liked this and I would definitely recommend it. The next book that I read was The Persistent Desire, a butch femme reader edited by Joe Nessel. Uh, I've been reading this for months now and it was really an IV drip of life. I would read like a couple essays or poems in here every few days or weeks and I would just return back to it and I finally finished it this month and wow. It's just so amazing to see how lesbians have been cool and legit and real forever. <laughs> like reading about these lesbians and their experiences from the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s and the butch femme dynamics that existed at that time and their butch experiences, their, le their femme experiences, their lesbian experiences. It was just their lesbian love, their lesbian eroticism, the lesbian sex and desire and oh god, it was just so everything. I was just, oh. It captured my heart and soul, truly. And I'm so thankful to my friend Amai for sending me a PDF of this book. It is an anthology with a lot of different butch femme lesbian writers and artists and activists over the latter half of the 20th century and it ranges from like sociological articles to just essays and personal memoir pieces, short stories, excerpts from Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg, poems and some photos, just amazing. Like also transcriptions of interviews and panels it's amazing. It's so good and obviously a five star read, like so fucking amazing. I talk about this in my reading vlog as well and in the reading vlog I talk about perhaps doing a video on like butch femme literature or butch femme lesbianism and history. I don't know. I don't know. Just let me know if you're interested. I say that in that video as well but not to be redundant. Anyways, but the last book I want to talk about here is a book that I haven't yet finished but I will finish this month because I'm so close to finishing it and that's because you can see here like I only have a little section left and that is Butter Honey Pig Bread by Francesca Equiasi. This book is also pretty excellent. I think it'll be like a four star read, 4.5 star read, maybe five stars, I'm not sure. Like wow, we had such a good reading month so far. This is a literary fiction novel that really encompasses so many things. It's about these twins and their mother. One of the twins is a lesbian chef. The other twin is going through a lot of shit with her relationship with her sister and their mom is sort of psychologically and spiritually disturbed but we get to see and the book starts off from the mom's perspective from like childhood even or from her birth and there's a underlying spiritual element as well but we get all of their different perspectives because they're all so integral to each other's narratives and the way that their stories are all tied together the way that they are obviously together as a family but the way that these women's lives are brought back together because now they're all back at their childhood home in Lagos and there is a bunch of different things happening. They've all experienced a lot of grief and trauma and terror in their family, both from 
the the death of their the girl's father and the mom's husband and the act of violence that happened that is referred to as the bad thing to the sisters as well as the sort of mental and spiritual unsettlement of their mother and we see all of their perspectives and all of their experiences through life from childhood to adulthood and we sort of get flashbacks throughout but it's told in this really cohesive narrative that also brings in all of their romantic relationships that helped construct who they are all of the loneliness they felt all the paths and journeys that they've taken on the family dynamics and community dynamics that have helped shape and construct them and the ways that their lives and selves have changed, their relationships have been altered negatively and positively over the years, and how they view each other and their relationships to their bodies and their selves, their identities, their relationship to motherhood and being daughters and being sisters. It's pretty brilliant. I'm excited to finish this. And yeah, I... I think it's also very well crafted as a narrative and these people feel very real and visceral and true and genuine. The story feels so earnest and truthful. So yeah, I am really enjoying this and I'm going to finish this today probably. So I wanted to in include it in part one of this wrap up. But yeah, I really like this. That's all of the books I've read this month so far. I hope you enjoyed this part of the video and I will see you in my next video if my part two of this video does come out as a different video and not in the same segment, if that makes sense. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye!